God is here in this building this morning. And he wants you to understand. He wants you to know that he loves you and he cares for you. And he's coming back to take you home with him. He's begging you to get yourself right with him. Open your heart and let him bless you the way he desires. Not to stand aside and let the things of this world crowd you and beat you down. But open up your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to move in you. Thank you so much, Paul. That's a message that we need to hear on a regular basis. What a wonderful praise time we had, and what a great day we had yesterday. Uh, many of you ladies I saw yesterday at the ladies' tea. The reason we had to cancel the men and women's breakfast next Saturday is because we normally want to do our community um, event out in the pavilion the first Saturday of every month, but because of the ladies' tea. And I haven't um, got the numbers on how much money was raised, but all of the money goes to prison ministry. And I, I do know this, there were a lot of ladies there and um, the place was full. We had a, we had a great service. Um, <clears throat> today is Mother's Day. What a glorious, wonderful thing God did when he gave us mothers and wives. Jeremiah mentioned that how sad it would be to worship without the mothers and the women here in church. And when he said that, the first thing that went through my mind was, well, that would be a Jewish Sabbath service, wouldn't it? Because all the men met separately from the women. But um, we believe that women are equal to men, and we celebrate them this morning as not only equal, they're equal but different, but we celebrate this, them this morning as a glorious creation of God. Um, I wanted to bring... My message, I wanted to begin my message with some things that our mothers taught us. Now, I'm not sure if you know all of these things, but the first thing our mothers taught us was foresight. Didn't our mothers tell us, make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident? Okay? Another thing my mother, our mothers taught us was logic. If you fall out of that tree and break your neck, don't come crying to me. Okay? That's, that's logical. Our mothers taught us about religion. You had better pray that that comes out of the carpet. <laughs> Have any of us heard that one? Time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. Now, I don't know if my mother ever said that. And how about genetics? You're just like your father. Um, contradiction. Shut your mouth and eat your dinner. That would be pretty difficult, wouldn't it? How about contortion? Will you look at that dirt on the back of your neck? That would also be rather difficult. And then there was the circle of life. I brought you in this world, and I'll take you out. But I'm pretty sure mothers didn't say that. That was Bill Cosby. I remember his tapes back in the 70s, and Bill's the one that said that one. So before I speak to the mothers this morning, I want to give just a wee bit of advice to the fathers. Um, first of all, don't ever buy your mother or your wife anything that plugs in. Because if you do, she's going to see that as a tool. Now, I know they told me that 45 years ago when we got married. But I can't tell you how many uh, Mother's Day, birthdays, Christmases, that my wife got a washer or a dryer or a microwave or something that had a plug. And she was proud to get it. She was glad to get it. Um, I think the idea behind this piece of advice is make sure you acknowledge her with um, a special gift as well as when, when, you're, when you're first married, um, you need to buy things that plug in sometimes as gifts for each other. And we would do that. We did that on a regular basis. Um, and the next thing is, if your mother or your wife currently does not have a membership of a, at a gym, do not offer to buy her one or buy her ex exercise equipment or videos. This mistake will cause you to lead you to six months of her asking you why you think she needs to exercise in the first place, okay? And the last bit of advice, guys, is that when you ask your wife or your mother where she would like to go out to eat for Mother's Day, she's going to say, um, it doesn't matter, you choose. My advice to you, you take her to your favorite place, to her favorite place. It does matter. 
You take her to where she wants to go. Um, Mother's Day is one of the few days throughout the year that moms are placed up on a pedestal and thanked for all that they do for us. My goal for the message this morning is for every mother here and every woman here to realize how important she is to the family design, how unique God made women, and how important she is to the home. The Bible says that the husband is the head of the home, and I agree with that 100%. But I have lived long enough to know that behind every successful man, there's a hardworking woman making him look good. I've lived long enough to know that. Um, the passage of scripture that I've chosen this morning is the story of a great mother that you hardly ever hear about. Although as I walked back in the hallway this morning <clears throat> and listened to the ladies' class, they were talking about the mother of Moses, Jochebed. And that's the passage that I chose to use for our message this morning. Um, in Exodus chapter 1, the Hebrew people of Israel had grown so numerous um, that the Pharaoh became afraid of them. And so by the end of chapter 1, he commanded all of the Hebrew women to throw their male children into the Nile River as soon as they were born. That verse is Exodus 1.22. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Can you imagine the pain and confusion of the Hebrew women who were required to comply with this order? What would you do if it was your son? Jochebed had a son, and she formulated a plan. In Exodus 2, 1 to 4, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put him among the reeds in the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Technically, Jochebed did exactly what Pharaoh said she had to do, to put her son into the Nile River. However, she put him in a waterproof basket, and she also sent her eldest, uh, Moses' elder daughter, elder sister, Miriam, to watch him. She put him in the reeds. She didn't put him out in the river. She put him close to the shore. One would assume that Moses was placed in this basket because of the natural mother instinct that she just could not bear to let her son die. However, we have another passage of scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And it tells us um, one of the motives that Jochebed and her husband had for placing him in the river. Hebrews eleven twenty three. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. One of the most important qualities that a mother can possess is faith in God. I can't say that often enough. Faith in God. A father's faith is important, yes. But many times fathers are working. It is the mothers that are giving basic life instructions to very small children. Mothers have been instrumental in faith forming in the lives of their children and grandchildren from the very beginning of time. There's a rich biblical record of mothers and grandmothers speaking faith into the lives of their children. We have this passage in 2 Timothy 1.5 where Paul is writing to Timothy and said, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Giving our children a godly foundation often begins with a mother teaching young children from an early age. Every Christian mother understands that for a home to function properly, first and most importantly, she needs to be firmly grounded in Christ. The life of Moses reveals that Jochebed was that kind of a mother. Moses grew up in the palace as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, yet he retained the faith of his biological mother. What happened to that little three-month-old baby who was set adrift in the Nile River? Verses 5 and 6. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. 
This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Pharaoh's daughter also had a motherly instinct. She knew right away that this baby was condemned to die by the Pharaoh, her father. But she saw him crying. She heard him crying. She felt sorry for him. She was conditioned by her culture and her upbringing to reject the Hebrew. But the cry of this baby, Moses, melted her heart. Just as a baby's cry melts mother's hearts today all over the world. God has given women natural instincts to protect and nurture children. Trust me, it takes a special ability from God for mothers to get up in the middle of the night to change diapers, to wipe noses, and to get up and and feed their babies when they themselves are bone tired. And then tomorrow they get up and do it all over again. We have some young mothers with us this morning, and they will attest to that. I've heard of women who have had abortions that often have lifelong issues dealing with guilt and confusion because of that mothering instinct they have to protect and to nurture children. What a a wonderful thing that happened this week when we heard of the possibility that the Supreme Court is going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And I hesitated to mention this because I don't believe that pastors should be political. But I don't consider that a political issue. I consider that a sin issue. This is an issue that's bothered me for 20 years. How could we as a nation allow that to happen? And especially mothers who... Nurture and love their children. All throughout the Bible, God condemns the killing of innocent babies. In Jeremiah 19, God said, The wickedness of killing your babies never even entered my mind. God said, I never even thought about that. Jeremiah 19, 5, They have built places here for worship of the god Baal so they could sacrifice their children as burnt offerings to him in the fire. Such sacrifices are something that I never commanded them to make. They are something that I never told them to do. Indeed, such a thing never even entered my mind. Now let me say this. If you're here this morning and you've been involved in an abortion or participated or helped pay for one, um, God is ready, willing, and able to forgive that. I remember years ago, back when I was first ordained in the ministry, there was a conference and there, it was early years, and it wasn't the abortion issue. It was, it was a gay issue. But they, one of the pastors got up in the conference and says, what are we going to do? What is the church going to do about the gay issue? And I remember a lady that stood up and said, we're going to categorize it. We're going to identify it. We're going to call it sin. And I thought, what a wonderful thing. Because God knows how to deal with sin. Sin that is confessed is forgiven. And it doesn't matter what kind of sin it is. If it's adultery, fornication, if it's stealing, if it's abortion, if it's any of the issues. But let's not be afraid to call it sin. Because God forgives sin. And there's no one sin that's worse than another. Um, When we're willing to categorize something as sin, God can fix it. I almost feel like it's a horrible thing to even talk about this on Mother's Day. But there's joy in my heart to think that for 50 years our nation has been burdened with this issue. And I believe that it's about going to be turned over to the state and allowed for each person to vote on that. After 50 years of shame on America, God is still working in this area. I knew a chaplain. He's passed away now. He was at... um, Defuniac Springs, and he had a little tiny plastic baby that he carried in his pocket every day to remind him of the abortion issue. And the reason it was important for the chaplain, because when we go into the prison and come out, you empty your pockets. And he would dump out all of his things, and one of the officers would see this little plastic baby and said, what in the world is that, and why are you carrying it around? And it was an opportunity for him to share his faith. And... It was just impressed on me many, many years ago that um, this is a horrible thing. In hindsight, we know 
But God had a plan to deliver Moses, and not only Moses, but all of the Hebrew children out of Egypt. So far, God is using the faith and the skill of Moses' parents, the current of the Nile River, and the heart of Pharaoh's daughter to further his plan and his purpose. Remember, Moses' sister Miriam stood close to see what was going to happen. Moses was not an only child. He had at least one older brother, Aaron, and an older sister, Miriam. And it says, verses 7 to 9, Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the, the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Then the woman took the baby and nursed him. Can you imagine the joy and disbelief in the heart of Jochebed when Pharaoh's daughter asked her to nurse and take care of her own son? When God rewards your faith, you will know that you have been blessed. God saved the life of her son, but he also arranged for her to take care of him. And if that was not enough, Pharaoh's daughter said, I will pay you to take care of this child for me. God rewarded the faith of Jochebed by giving her son back to her and then helped her with financially compensated to take care of him. No doubt it was the early years of Moses' life that he learned about the God of Israel and who the Hebrew people were and that he was one of them. Every godly mother realizes that when God's ways are implemented early in a child's life, and within the home, lifelong habits are established. When a child is taught from birth the correct way to live, by the time they become an adult themselves, they will already be well grounded in the proper way to live. There's a verse in Proverbs 21.6 that says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Mothers, do not ever believe that your effort with your children and even your husbands have been in vain or for nothing. Don't ever believe that. We teach our children to be godly, and then we have to turn them loose in a wicked world. We allow them to make their own decisions. But this verse says, when he is old, he will not depart from it. Did you catch that? They're going to make decisions when they're young. That may not be the right decision. But that biblical foundation that we give them is going to stay with them the rest of your li their lives. So if you have children that are not where you want them to be, claim this verse. We have a biblical promise that the foundation we give our children will follow them all of their lives, regardless of their current situation or choices. This verse is a promise from God. They may wander away from church when they're young and impressionable, but when they're old, they're going to remember their foundation that they had as a child. Today, we're celebrating mothers. Mothers are unique. I'm not ashamed to say that God created mothers different from fathers. I told you, I believe they're equal. Men and women are equal. That's biblical. But unique, different. There's a story about a little boy sitting on the front steps with his head Face cradled in his hands, looking so forlorn. And his father came home from work and said, Son, what's wrong? And the little boy looked up and said, Well, Dad, just between the two of us, I'm having some trouble with your wife. <laughs> sometimes mothers have to be tough. And sometimes love requires tough love. Sometimes we may have a problem with our mothers. But in the end, we usually discover our mothers were right the first time. Many times I've wondered where our children would be if it were not for the prayers of our mothers and grandmothers. In my own life, I had a grandmother in southern Indiana who prayed for her children, her grandchildren, by name every day. And I am convinced in my life that those prayers made a difference. And it is one of the reasons that I am a pastor today, because of the prayers of my grandmother. Your prayers for your children, mothers, are so important. Mothers have special abilities that help keep their home and their family in working order. Jochebed was certainly instrumental in the life of Moses in his early years. In verse 10 and 11, it said, When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and, she, and he became her son. 
She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. The Bible does not say how old Moses was when Jochebed took him back and, and gave him to Pharaoh's daughter. It only says that when the child grew older. I would imagine that he was about kindergarten, grade school, six, seven years old. I would imagine. I don't know. But I do know that children that are younger than that are very demanding and require constant care and attention. And I can't imagine that the daughter of a pharaoh is going to have the time or the inclination to put that much effort into the life of a small child. But she did adopt Moses as her son. And that adoption meant Moses was now in the royal family. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus wrote that Moses was heir to the throne of Egypt and that while as a young man, he led the armies of Egypt in victorious battle against the Ethiopians. Certainly he was raised with all of the learning and the science of Egypt. In Acts 7.22, it said, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in deed and word. Egypt was one of the most academic and scientific societies among ancient cultures. It is reasonable to believe that Moses was instructed in geography, history, grammar, writing, literature, philosophy, and music. Isn't it interesting that the lessons he learned at his mother's knee was the lessons that he remembered? the longest. My Old Testament professor said that Moses attended three different schools. The school of his mother's knee, the school of Pharaoh's daughter, and the school of the desert was the third one. How important was his mother's school? In Exodus 2.11, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses had grown, and he went out to his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. That word looked is a really important word. In Hebrew, it means that he looked to see with emotion. He was now 40 years old. He was trained and groomed to become the ruler of Egypt. But when he looked at their burdens, he remembered that he was one of them. And that their God was his God. And it wasn't Pharaoh's daughter that taught him that. It was his mother, Jacobin. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He, dis he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Moses knew who he was. As much as he enjoyed the pleasures and the ease of an Egyptian he knew that this is not really me. How did he even know what sin was? It says he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. How did he know that it was sin? He knew that it was sin because he had a godly mother named Jochebed. In our weekly Bible study, Dean is always telling us that Old Testament names have meanings and meanings are important. The name Jochebed means God's glory. And when I thought of that, I thought of mothers and wives everywhere. The name Eve means mother of all living things. This morning we celebrate our wives and our mothers. We give glory to God for this wondrous and glorious creation that he gave mankind when he created mothers. We don't pretend to understand them. We simply praise God for the wonderful gift of mothers and wives. I just seen recently, uh, someone said, if you can understand why pizza is round, and we put it in a square box, and we cut it in triangles to eat it, if you can understand that, then you can understand women. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I do know this. Mothers and wives are very complex. And the reason that God made them unique is because they perform a work that he has for them to do. You know that man was the only thing that God created that he said it's not good. Everything else God created said it is good. He created it is good. He created the sun. Everything else it is good. When he created man, it is not good for man to be alone. He needs a partner. This morning, we thank God 
for our wives and mothers. We thank God for the blessing that God knew that we needed some help. And we praise God for the mothers and wives that he's given us. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much in your infinite wisdom of giving us partners, wives, and mothers. Thank you, Father, that you made women unique and that they complement husbands and, and fathers. And together, they make the family unit that you love so much. Father, help us to be bold enough to call sin, sin. Help us, Father, to love those who have been involved in sin. We don't hate the, the sinners. We hate the sin. But we love sinners. God, help us to be grateful for our mothers and our wives this morning. And Father God, we ask this in your precious holy name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That we would pray for our mothers and our wives this morning. Um, so if the ladies want to come up. And I'd like you just to stand here with the roses. Come on. Oh, come on. I want to make sure everybody gets one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, Edith, um, you can sit right there if you want to, too. Paul, can you, where did Paul go? Oh. <laughs> I'm asking if you'd help me pass out these roses. <laughs> God bless you, Tuner. We love you. Mothers are so special. <laughs> no, this is kind of the way they came. <laughs> Have you said that one? <laughs> what did you say Dr. Beggs means? Meant? Who? Dr. Beggs. What did her name mean? Her name means God's triumph. No, God's triumph. God's triumph? Okay. Did everybody have one? I don't want to miss anybody. Oh, Tony? You know, Paul told me, he said... Paul said, I think I should get a rose because I raised my son by my, I was both the father and the mother. <laughs> Let's see, we got a couple more coming. Kendra? Kendra's coming too? Or did she come yet? Oh, Kendra's here. I knew Marilyn and got you. Yeah. I'll let you pray when she's okay. dead. Okay. You need to be there in the Right up there. Here, you want to hold the mic so she can hear it? I got it. Go ahead. Um, can you read it? I can't read. Can't she wrote it in cursive. I would, I would give my grandchildren greeting cards, and they said, Grandpa, I can't read cursive. <laughs> yeah. Okay, she wants to give all the mother's presents also, and then we'll have a special prayer for the mothers. Dear Father, we thank you today for our moms, and we thank you for the love that they've shown us, and the kindness, and the mercy. We thank you for the patience that they've had with us, Lord. 
We thank you because they've taught us how to live, how to get through life. They taught us how to deal with situations that, that we never even thought that we would run into, Lord. They've been our mentors, our teachers, and the love of our life. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless our mothers, that you will strengthen them. And those that are young, Lord, that you will continue to give them the strength that they need to raise their family. And we just thank you today for all that you've done and for all your grace. In the name of Jesus, amen.